We've got Greg Saper here on Skype, and he's going to use this Screen Hero software to kind of um, navigate his own presentation. So let's hope that all goes well. So Greg Saper is professor and director of the Language, Literacy and Culture PhD program at UMBC in Baltimore, Maryland, US. And he's the author of Intimate Bureaucracies, uh, 2012, Networked Art, 2001, and Artificial Mythologies, 1997. And he has edited or co-edited volumes on post 2010, Imagining Place, 2009, and Drifts, 2007. He has published widely on fluxes and visual poetry and serves as the reviews editor and blog report columnist for Rhizomes. His curatorial projects include exhibits on Assemblings, 1997, Noir Concrete Poetry in Brazil, 1998, and Typebound, 2008, as well as Folkfind.org, 2003 till 2006. In addition, he has published two other pamphlets on Being Read, 1985, and Raw Material, 2008, as well as edition of Bob Brown's Words, 2010, and Reedies, 2010. Saper is presently writing a biography of the poet, publisher, impresario, writer in every imaginable genre, Bob Brown, who invented an avant-garde reading machine. The simulation of the reading machine can be found at Saper's website, which is readies.org. Greg, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, apology for the... Uh, uh, do, I, do they hear the echo? No. Um, Good. So um, I, I can see how I fit quite nicely with this panel so far, because my scholarship began um, with a study of Sanzidat um, books and publishing um, and in not only locally, but also internationally with uh, the word that was used at the time called assemblings. Um, and what it led to was an interest that continues today in alternative forms of publishing and alternative uh, models of infrastructure in academia. So um, I wanted to begin though by shifting gears a little bit and uh, showing you uh, a clip. An R Foundation manages an anonymous and confidential telephone line to attend children and teenagers under a risk situation. As a result of International Day Against Child Abuse, we launch a message for those once suffering any kind of abuse. A message exclusively for them, hidden from adults' eyes. The outdoor uses a lenticular to assemble two images, the one aimed at adults and the other aimed at children. The lenticular allows you to see one image from one angle and a different image from another angle. From the average height by age, we can determine what part of each image will be seen by each person. In this way, we find an area only visible by children under 10. A message only for children and a warning for adults. In any case, um, what I'm trying to show there is, is two things. One is an example of um, uh, social uh, media, uh, media activism, and uh, part of a Spanish organization called Aid to Children and Adolescents at Risk Foundation. Um, but more importantly, I'm trying to show um, an example of paradoxically targeted and multiple messages at the same time. Uh, so what I'm trying to demonstrate there in that, in that clip is um, the idea of uh, uh, that we can send out messages uh, into a larger public audience, but that we can also simultaneously target those uh, messages to individual audiences. So it's one of the, the conflicts I think that we've seen and talked about earlier in the panel uh, in terms of uh, how are we going to create uh, public activist uh, uh, scholarship. And so this might be one way if we think about this in terms of uh, a metaphor um, and not simply the literal billboard strategy. 
I'm going to try to go forward. Should I click it again? No. You're good. And now I should click play. And it should play on your sound. Okay. So although this is, um, you know, uh, a very important issue in the social realm in the United States, the Trayvon Martin case, uh, where um, he was uh, shot uh, by uh, a, a vigilante um, uh, and um, the vigilante wasn't charged with murder. So this is talking about how the media picked it up and it's very popular in terms of the, the the uh, mass media picked up these studies to look at how uh, the media responded to this controversy and what dates and what happened at which times. But in fact, this is rather an example of a conservative move in the digital humanities, which is usually thought of in terms of a restricted concordance style of research and instances of a media story. Um, that is then visualized and charted. Um, so when we think of digital humanities scholarship, at least in the United States, this is what we think of first, uh, this kind of visualization, um, what I call the small tent or narrow focus digital humanities. Valuable, but it doesn't really move us beyond a kind of uh, traditional notion of what the humanities are doing. That is, it, it's very much about um, a fixed notion of the humanities. So as Sarah said earlier in the, um, in, in the panel, um, there might be an alternative to this, which would be uh, rethinking the notion of what the humanities are essentially that is not necessarily uh, a fixed and uh, a fixing of meanings, but rather uh, some something else, which I'm going to talk about here. So let's see if this works. So I mean, I've put together. I mean, Sarah earlier today rightly sort of pointed out that this term multimodal has now become the new mana word of uh, scholarship. Nevertheless, I've switched over to that word rather than digital humanities, which seem to be problematic. And so basically, these are the arguments that I have with administrators in the humanities, especially, uh, but throughout the university. So as soon as we start thinking about alternative forms of scholarship, uh, we also have to start thinking about uh, how do we convince uh, administrators and infrastructural administrators uh, that this is something that is valuable. So the first one is simply to point to frame the argument in terms of um, bigotry, uh, prejudice against anything that's not printed on paper um, and that rather no longer privileging that one mode of delivery over all others. And this is a huge argument among administrators. I mean, they're like still wanting to have something they can hold in their hand. Uh, the other is uh, that major scholarly organizations, associations are already beginning to, to pick up this mantle. So the Modern Language Association now um, in their bibliographic uh, um, uh, bibliographic guidelines uh, mentioned that you need to uh, uh, put the word print after a, a book in a bibliography that is um, printed. Uh, so that is, it's not privileging that form, but it's rather thinking of that form as exceptional. And that was in 2007, but th these things take time in academia. Finally, then, you know, that it, it makes available new tools, perspectives, and types of knowledge. And what I'm interested in is that third one, the types of knowledge. Administrators being instrumentalists are interested in the new tools, basically. That is, they want to buy equipment. They want to know what the new tools are. 
the multimodal book equivalents are still part of the history of the book and printing. So, I mean, again, when I talk to administrators, one of the things that I've tried to explain is that why social media scholarship, which could be the next mana word or mana phrase that we'll begin to use, that is simply wider access to and dissemination of information. Politicians love that sort of thing. New potential to manage, mine, map, and remix data and materials, the transformation of scholarship, the enhancement and in innovation in teaching, learning, and thinking, increase public impact, awareness, engagement, and support. So again, this is in my trajectory, what I became interested in is um, all forms of publication. So the first experiment I did, whoops, it went, it went too far. Should I just let it, should I try to go back? You can let it play because it'll be silent. So I'm just gonna let this play. Uh, it's a film, uh, a reading of, um, of Daniel Lewski's Only Revolutions. And uh, it's a film about the reading process. And so what I became interested in is how will reading itself change to correspond to um, So um, in any case, what, what I became interested in was the notion of reading itself and how reading will change in response to these new forms or multimodal forms of publication. And that that process of reading will be remediated back into the way that we read traditional books. So because of that, I began to publish um, books that were about the reading process. And I think this is really an exciting area that we really haven't begun to think about. That much of the focus has been on writing, on publishing, but um, what we might be thinking about is that reading itself as a mechanical process is, um, is uh, going to change. Um, so and as part of that, what we tried to do was um, to think about um, uh, how publishing could respond to new reading practices. So although we think of reading as being um, simply a matter of uh, responding to the print literacy mode, uh, what if reading was going to lead the way in new forms of publishing? That is that as the new reading methods uh, evolve, uh, we're going to have to respond after the curve with new forms of publication. Um, and so you can see here in this example, um, that reading um, is going to respond um, in radically different ways to the book itself, but also because of the various different multimodalities that we're now running as an experiment in our culture, uh, that publishing will have to respond to that as well. And so I first did some experiments where I simply published one book with three different publishers. Uh, one of them uh, gave away the book free online. Uh, mm -hmm. One of them mm -hmm. sold the book uh, as part of a series called Minor Compositions, which was Autonomedia publisher. Um, and he basically just goes to book fairs and sells the books there. Um, you probably know him. Uh, and um, in any case, the third one was AK, uh, press, which is uh, an anarchist press that publishes political work. Um, but I, what I did as an experiment is instead of thinking of the writing as simply the content of the book, I thought of the publication process itself as part of the writing process. Uh, so The, the writing process um, was in that book called Intimate Bureaucracies was as much about dealing with three different publishers to publish one little pamphlet. 
Um, and the, so the idea there was that infrastructure could become a kind of poetry or what I've called in the past socio-poetics. But I'm interested now in what I'm gonna call infrastructuralism, a kind of parody or play on structuralism, but now thinking of uh, creation of infrastructure as a kind of form of poetry. Um, so we've heard about conceptual poetry, language poetry, flarf, et cetera. But what I'm interested in is the poetry of infrastructure, you know, which has allusions to, to Marx, uh, but also to uh, a kind of socio-poetics, Joseph Boyce, for example. And in one of those experiments, then I published this small little pamphlet with these three different publishers. Come and walk through the folk find site and see how it's grown from the seed of an idea to an organically growing garden of sites featuring artists, communities, and scholars. In 2002, two professors wanted to find a new way to present research on Florida folk life to a wider international audience. They sought to conserve and document folk life and to translate scholarship into interactive media online. This was the beginning of the Folkvine project. In 2002, I met Kristen Congdon, and she explained to me that the culture of Central Florida was often misunderstood. It was often thought about in terms of theme parks, and instead, we should think about it in terms of the rich cultural traditions in this area. I've been doing research on folk art for 30 years, and I came to Florida in 1988 and started researching about Florida folk artists. And I found so many amazing people that when I met Craig Saper, um, we decided together that we needed to do a website on some of these amazing people so that people could understand what it was like to visit with these extraordinary individuals. Not everyone in the world can visit a folk artist at home in rural Florida, for example, but the surrounding communities, cultural heritage, and the processes involved in making art and building communities were crucial to our project. After building a team of scholars, artists, and students, the group set out to create this unique project, meeting and documenting these extraordinary artists. The uniqueness of the Folkvine project is that we don't just study the artists as an object of study, but we use their sensibility and their aesthetics and their community's uh, traditions as a model for how we would represent them and how we would organize our website. So we began the project by going out in the countryside and other places in Central Florida and finding these folk traditions and these artists. And we began to talk about how we're going to translate that to an online experience. And one of the things that I work on is how scholarship changes when we move online. What are the advantages to moving online in terms of organization, in terms of design, in terms of visual and sonic effects? Working on Folkvine raises a lot of different kinds of questions. It's very different from writing a book. One of the issues that we've had to deal with is about representation. How are we representing other people? Are we doing it in an ethical manner? Um, we are also learning about ways to collaborate. It seems that when we bring a number of different kinds of people together, faculty, community artists, students, we're able to ask questions and do things that are much more expansive, much more complex, much more detailed than if we were working all alone. Folkvine meetings are often about digging up ideas, looking for the metaphor that works for each artist. Once we hit on an idea, we work with a designer to help her make real the concept we've discussed. On Ginger Lavoie's site, for example, the physical caress of the fabric was so important that it was designed into her site. 
The mouse rolling over the image serves as a virtual caress. Every good garden needs a plan, paths to walk along, and a friendly, knowledgeable guide who knows the names of what's growing. At some point while we were growing folk vine, we realized we needed just this, markers, paths, and guides to our site. Again, we worked to find a fitting metaphor, and we hit upon one that worked for all of us. Once we came up with it, it seemed obvious, a quirky roadside Florida visitor center, where you can pick up a tour guide to lead you through the content of the site, focusing on various humanities concepts, or ask a bobblehead to give you his or her two cents. Hi, I'm Craig Safer. You might have heard my name, but now you can see my bobblehead in action. The direction that Folkvine took was influenced not only by the various folk artists' aesthetics, but also by the research interests of the team of faculty, artists, and students. For me, as a folklorist, given that we're firmly entrenched in the digital age, the question becomes, how can we use new media in ways that involve, rather than alienate, the communities with whom we work? Like all members of the Folkvine.org team, my role in the project was very varied and flexible. I would move from one assignment to the other and fill many different roles. I, um, I sculpted the bobbleheads on the project, for example. The bobbleheads are a way that the academic voices can speak and explain different things from the project. And I d sculpted the figures, sort of caricatures, of the people who worked on the project. The world is multicultural and multilingual. And the United States is multicultural and multilingual, and so is Florida. Therefore, it's logical that Folkvine also is multicultural and multilingual. Text is unusual in the Folkvine website because we have complete flexibility in terms of how much text for a given artist site and the types of text that we can use. So that some of the sites have long passages of description or explanations of an artist's process or um, a long narrative about the artist's life. And other ones have brief, funny skits or verbal games that you can play. And we did that so that we could reflect the artist's sensibilities. One of the most important things that we find our artists doing is drawing from their past, drawing from their homes to create a new home. Many of our artists are in Florida, but have come from somewhere else. And what they're trying to do is bring together an aesthetic, a set of values, a set of concerns from another place and bring them together with the ones that they've found in Florida here. As an integral part of the Folkvine process, we held events in each of the artists' communities to present the websites and gather feedback. In this way, we cultivated a holistic relationship between the artists, their communities, and the website. Many thousands have participated in the websites online at folkvine.org and we began to realize that although the world could not beat a path to these artists, we could open a window onto their worlds. I did want to show you that one in part because my argument here today is that a, a real disruption to the humanities will have to happen at the level of um, the way that we produce text. That is, we won't produce uh, PDFs that doesn't really uh, change uh, the relationship to knowledge. Uh, rather, what I'm interested in producing is what I'm calling visceral scholarship. Uh, that is, multi, multiple ways of approaching um, uh, evidence and knowledge. But you can see, in some ways, this project that you just looked at was very palatable. Um, it wasn't uh, it didn't appear to be that radical in some ways. But in part, that was because we were um, community-based. Uh, we went out into the community and we worked with the artists uh, to put their work to make it more accessible. But one of the things that's important here is that one of the first artists we looked at was a clown shoe maker. And the clown shoe maker, um, was uh, built miniature circuses. And if you go to folkvine.org and navigate through it, you can find his um, miniature circuses. Some of it's somewhat perverted, um, but 
but fascinating for that reason. In any case, he built these miniature circuses and he did two strategies that we're borrowing. One is he did something called kit bashing, kit bashing. And kit bashing is uh, taking uh, an existing model train uh, figurine and breaking it or bashing it and then reformulating it into what you need it to do. So one of the things he would do at the time is he would collect little logos from the circuses from candy wrappers and then he would put those on the side of a train and other things like that. So in that way, that kind of, when he said to us what his strategy was, uh, we immediately thought, oh my gosh, this is a, a better metaphor than even remixing, which doesn't really get at this notion that we're interested in, which is occupying a form that already exists and bashing it, kit bashing, to produce something else that's basically more fun. Uh, or more whatever it is that you're going for, but using that strategy as a as the method of scholarship, kit bashing. The second thing that he said to us, and before I tell you what that second thing is, let me tell you that uh, two weeks after we made the film of uh, this particular uh, circus clown that built the miniatures, he passed away, he died. So we didn't know that at the time, but it was this strange thing where somebody whose life is about trying to make people laugh was, was dying. In any case, what he said to us was, do not put this work in a museum. Uh, he said, I don't want it to be on four white walls. And we heard that in art theory and in, in theoretical discussions about the four white walls and the, steri the sterilizing of art. And he told us right there, I mean, he looked at us and he said, this is what my legacy is. I don't want it to be in a museum. Um, and there's a larger political conversation about that, which has to do with the Barnum family that gave a lot of money to a museum in Sarasota, Florida, which is a very conservative art museum. And they have white walls and unbelievable art paintings on the walls. What he said was, I want it to be circusy. Circusy. And that made me think a lot about this idea of thinking about knowledge in relationship to the object of study. That is, we didn't look at these people as simply objects of study, but rather as giving us the model for how we would actually represent them. We would represent them using their own sensibility. And this is my major argument and really has informed my work since then, which is to rethink our relationship to the knowledge, to the objects of, that we are supposedly studying as instead models for the form of the publication. So the way that the folk find looks is, um, is, is based on that notion. How do we make it look like we felt when we were interacting with these artists? And each one had a very different notion of that. And then we sort of put it all together into one. So that's my theoretical track. And I'm just going to sort of summarize quickly uh, what we're doing now. So what we're doing now is we're looking at the most conservative uh, bastion of publication, which is uh, university press publications. And what we're doing here at this very small university um, probably similar in some ways to Coventry, uh, that is that we're not Harvard or Yale. And when I tell people my ambitions, they go to, they say to me, even the people here say to me, who do you, who the hell do you think you are? You'll never be able to compete against Harvard or Yale or Hopkins, which is also in Baltimore, Maryland. Why bother? And I, I think that's 
something I had to learn an answer to, to be honest with you. If you talk to administrators, they say things like that to you and you need to have an answer. In any case, what we're going to try to do is start a university press. And we're going to try to start a university press specifically for inextricably multimodal works, works that could never be produced in a PDF. Why? Because other people are doing the PDFs much better than we could ever do, including Hopkins. They, they run JSTOR, including open access press. Everyone is able to do that better than us. But what we're interested in is something that could only be reproduced in a multimodal form. And we're working with Anvil Academics in the United States. And um, what we're doing is a series of projects that are also, so that's one side of it. The other side of it is community-based scholarship. Many of you probably know Baltimore from the TV show, The Wire. Uh, and how many, just a show of hands, I'm just sort of curious, how many of you have seen The Wire? So yeah, there you go. And so, I mean, we have this great burden. I mean, everyone thinks of that. And that actually, if you visit me here, I'll, I live not too far from that neighborhood, but it is one neighborhood, but Baltimore is a troubled place. But we're interested then in engaging Baltimore in community-based scholarship. So Baltimore is celebrating uh, the end of the War of 1812, which ended in 1814. Um, and um, because of that, there's a lot of interest in Baltimore itself. So some historians are doing uh, work and um, a number of people have projects looking at different communities, troubled, contested spaces in Baltimore. So our probably our first uh, publication will be this volume of multimodal works that are community based about Baltimore. Anyway, I'm going to end it there and I'm sorry for the technical difficulties, but um, hopefully we can recover. Thank you so much.